For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. I'm Surya Gangadharan, and a very happy New Year to all our viewers. Uh, let's get to our uh, show this evening in the New Year. It's on Myanmar, and uh, we're going to bring you up to speed on uh, the recent developments there. Um, I have a small graphic coming up for you, which uh, tells us why Myanmar's diplomatic isolation may be changing in the New Year. Uh, the graphic basically says that. Um, Cambodia's President Hun Sen will be visiting Myanmar very soon. As the chair of ASEAN, he is expected to signal a change in policy towards Myanmar. India's Foreign Secretary uh, Harsh Shingla was in uh, Myanmar in December, and um, China handed over a submarine to the Myanmar Navy. We also have countries like Japan that are showing a willingness to engage with the military junta in Nepal. Uh, so those are the uh, uh, recent developments there. Let me now bring in my guest for this evening, Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay. He was our ambassador there in Myanmar some years ago and closely follows trends there. Uh, ambassador Mukhopadhyay, welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, ambassador, um, what are the broad um, diplomatic trends you've seen, uh, you've observed in Myanmar? Yeah. Uh, well, Surya, thank you for your sort of graphic introduction. Um, you know, towards the end of last year, we saw actually greater pressure on the uh, on the military regime to actually initiate some kind of dialogue and reconciliation and, uh, you know, move towards democracy uh, with the ASEAN summit and its five-point formula. Uh, you know, as, as, as you know, in the ASEAN summit also, uh, Senior General Min Ong Lang was not invited. And subsequently, there was a meeting in China between China and the ASEAN to which also uh, senior general was not uh, formally invited. So there seems to be a significant change towards, uh, uh, you know, engagement. On the one hand, uh, we have also China sort of pushing from behind. Uh, we have, um, a, you know, the Cambodian president taking an initiative to once again re-engage the Tamado uh, if, uh, with a view to finding a solution. And as you pointed out, there are a number of other countries that have taken more or less informal uh, initiatives to engage the Myanmar government on specific issues. Uh, so I would say that right now there's been a slight change of gear. What we are seeing, witnessing, is a trend towards engagement. Uh, though I would uh, say that you know the, the pressures for the military regime to also uh, enter into a dialogue with uh, the national unity government or the opposition in general uh, will remain. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's odd, you know, Ambassador, that uh, the junta hasn't shown any inclination to change its um, public stance. You know, the uh, we keep reading reports about uh, killings in the countryside, uh, attacks yeah. on civilian installations, arrest yeah. of people, and there was a sentencing of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. Right, right. So this is very much in the nature uh, of the, the the military regime that it's not given to come. Compromise. Uh, in particular, they see the NLD and Do Aung San Suu Kyi specifically uh, very much as uh, you know forces that they would like to actually eliminate as far as possible from the Myanmar political scene. Uh, it's very much a clash between people power and military power, between institutional power and uh, you know uh, and uh, and democracy uh, and uh, the and the leadership of uh, Do Su. Uh, and at the same time, also a clash between charismatic power uh, and the, the military. So, you know, uh, really the, the, the Tamado is not given to, um, to compromise on this. Uh, and I think their uh, consideration is that uh, there is division in the international community. Uh, they can play for time. Uh, if they continue along this part, at some point or the other, the international community will be driven to engage in some form or the other, whether it is humanitarian aid or uh, or, or just uh, in the individual concerns of individual countries, be they security related or geopolitical. So they are sort of banking on that. Is the so, military its own constituency, uh, Bajra? Is it uh, only looking at its own, you know, uh, power and pelf? Yes, I would say so. You know, I think the, the Tamado at one time represented uh, Myanmar independence, uh, Myanmar sovereignty, Myanmar unity. But in this particular avatar, I think it is very much, uh, you know, really serving its own interests. Uh, I think for the first time, we can think of 
uh, the, the Myanmar military being against practically the whole of its people. At different times, it has been ethnic groups. Uh, in 1988, it was against you know, the entire pro-democracy movement. Uh, but now I would say that it almost stands for nothing other than itself. It has very few constituencies other than itself and its associates that it represents. Um, uh, the Baba majority, the heartland uh, of Myanmar uh, in particular is, you know, very, uh, uh, very militantly uh, anti the Tamado. And that is its core constituency, you know, which was the Bama constituency, the Buddhist constituency, as opposed to uh, the, 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 the ethnic areas, uh, which had different ethnicities, different degrees of, uh, you know, different religions as well, and a different relationship uh, with the uh, with the originally Yangon and subsequently Nepido. Mm -hmm. What? How do you gauge the internal situation there? If, as you mentioned, uh, people seem to be turning against the uh, junta, um, it's not really apparent, is it? Uh, well, you know what we are seeing is what we saw were really massive civil uh, disobedience movement in the early stages of the the takeover. And subsequently, what we have seen is a migration from the cities to the countryside. A lot of the Bama youth also uh, moving to the countryside. We have seen new people's defense forces, new uh, resistance coming up in places like Chin State uh, and Kaya State. Uh, in Karen, the, the, the struggle continues. Uh, initially, there was also a strong sort of movement amongst the Kachins. Uh, the, the Arakan army has, of course, made a kind of tactical ceasefire with the Tamado at the moment. Mm -hmm. In Zalain region, you know, which is very much in the heartland of, uh, of Myanmar, uh, we've had strong resistance in Zagain and Magwe, that is to the west of the Irrawaddy River. The Irrawaddy River. Uh, so I would say that, you know, given the overwhelming military power, uh, the, uh, the uh, monopoly of uh, force that the Tamado has, they have been able to suppress uh, the people's movement uh, 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 to quite an extent. And, you know, the people's defense forces don't really have access to uh, financial funds as well as armaments. So they are with their back to the wall. They are subdued perhaps for the moment. But that hasn't actually changed to any form of consent. Uh, and a sullen resistance will continue and it will uh, keep coming up from time to time. I think the situation is very different from 1988, 1990. Uh, when the Tamado was able to make peace individually with, uh, you know, the 15, 16 odd uh, uh, ethnic armed organizations on yeah. the one hand, and was able to co-opt the Bama ha heartland uh, in this larger narrative of the unity of the country, which they kind of represented. But I think things have changed. You know, 50 years of Tamado rule uh, gave way to 10 years of relative freedom, access to the international community access to the net, Facebook, you know, the social media. And the young people in particular have tasted both freedom uh, as well as opportunity. Uh, and uh, I don't, I, I mean, I don't see them prevailing. I don't see the PDFs uh, who are all fighting their separate wars or the NUG, which is trying to unify them. I don't see them being able to prevail in the short run. Uh, the, you know, the, the Tamado has all the force at its disposal. Uh, but I don't see them being able to govern in any normal sense for uh, uh, for some time in the near future. Where would you see India's role? Now, Harsh Stringler was there last month. Um, yes. Are we still largely driven by the security calculus when it comes to Myanmar? Um, I wouldn't say solely security calculus, but I would say that's the sort of most, uh, you know, that's the most pressing thing that uh, we, we feel. I think uh, the other consideration would be that, you know, for 50 years during the military room, uh, rule, uh, you know, India more or less lost touch with Myanmar. And there was this yeah. sense that a country that had been closely anchored to it historically had drifted away towards China and towards the ASEAN. Uh, and so 50 years, you know, there was a sense of disengagement, a psychological estrangement practically. Pra I mean, both countries practically forgot that they were physical neighbors. So yeah. I don't think, um, you know, India as a whole, um, the government of India would like to lose that particularly people to people connection. And I think that's why uh, we constantly, even as we uh, in some ways have engaged with the with the Tamado, we continue to harp on the issue of democracy. But yes, you see, one of the things that has happened is that as a result of this instability, uh, Indian insurgent groups that have been taking refuge, shelter and are even based 
in, in Western Myanmar, uh, not far from the border, they seem to have got more active, whether it's in uh, drug trafficking drug trafficking, or, uh, you know, other more militant activity. And I think one issue that really did uh, force this visit uh, was the attack on the, uh, the commandant of the SAM rifles in southern Manipur. And possibly they also had some intelligence that led to the unfortunate, you know, uh, massacre of, uh, well, killing of uh, Nagas in Oting, in Mon district. Um, so uh, I think there is genuinely a concern that this instability is contributing to uh, a revival or uh, of uh, militant activity across the border, which is going to affect, which is already affecting our Northeast, in addition to the refugee issue and the kind of political uh, pressures that it puts on us. And I think there's an additional fact that, you know, uh, while I think the international community, India included, has left it to the ASEAN to find a solution. Um, you know, uh, the fact is that um, India is not a part of ASEAN and India is a neighbor and India is directly affected uh, yeah. by the, 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 you know, the instability and the internal conflict there. Uh, and therefore, you know, India is forced uh, in its own interest uh, to be to have to to deal uh, with it on matters that of security that really closely concern it. So I think the most pressing issue is security. But I would say that the uh, the people to people dimension is also uh, very much there. Mm -hmm. Would you? What is the uh, Myanmar junta's uh, capacity to be able to uh, take care of the insurgents or handle them? I don't know, yeah. given the fact that it's fighting another war of its own. Right. Uh, so you know, the, the, there are two things. In over fifty years, the Myanmar uh, military regime has virtually all the has, has controlled all the institutions. Um, uh, you know, it had economic holdings. Uh, Myanmar, as you know, is a very rich country in terms of natural resources. It has access to that natural resource, those resources. So long there are buyers, big buyers like China, willing to buy their jade, their copper, uh, uh, their oil and many other natural timber and many other natural resources that they have. It is said that they also have rare earths. Uh, you know, the Myanmar government can continue to extract resources and uh, uh, monetize these resources and and uh, continue to survive. They also have access to arms, uh, both from China and uh, increasingly, I mean, and traditionally also and increasingly from Russia. Uh, so the Myanmar government, uh, I mean, the, the Tamado has the capacity and the resources uh, to uh, sustain itself on this rather uh, reckless and uh, uh, rather repressive path uh, for quite some time. Um, and, you know, that is not really very good news uh, for those who wish to see a future for the youth and, uh, you know, democracy uh, in Myanmar. So, so what is the way forward? Would you, do you think the UN could play a role here? Um, yeah, you know, I think the, what we have to look at is we have to have to look at both the short term, uh, where the reality is that, uh, uh, you know, the the the, the resistance is under pressure and the military seems to be having, at least for the time being, the upper hand. Yeah. Um, the the medium-term outcome. Uh, the medium-term outcome, that what I see is that, you know, even the armed insurgent organizations, uh, they have been fighting the central government, uh, different governments for the last 70 years, and they have never been able to get their act together and yeah. form a unified front. Now you have the Bama also against the uh, the, the the majority uh, in the Bama heartland also against the Tamado, uh, but I don't think we are seeing the kind of unity that would be required. You know that to to force uh, the the Tamado into uh, a compromise, and yet you know the feeling of alienation, the feeling of betrayal, the feeling of bitterness amongst the Myanmar remain, and so to the extent that um, uh, let's say if the international community were to re-engage and somehow at the end of it uh, do business uh, with the Tamado, um, I, I wouldn't rule out a kind of further, you know, uh, backlash uh, mm -hmm. from the people. So really what I see is, um, you know, long term, at least medium term instability uh, until uh, a new new leadership arrives either from the within the military or from outside the military uh, that is able to put the country uh, back together again. Uh, it's difficult to see even the Tamado really managing to enforce uh, stability and governance in the meantime. But 
you know, it's a rich country and the economy will continue. So uh, they will not be under the kind of pressure, let's say, that we see in places like Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So what do we tell them when Harsh Shringla goes there? What does he talk to them about? Since are we able to influence their conduct in any way? Um, you know, the Myanmar army, the Tamado, has actually historically been quite resistant to, resistant to influence. Uh, they've had a strong sense of themselves as an institution. Myanmar itself um, has a strong sense of its own autonomy and independence. Remember, until the British, they had fought back the, 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 the Chinese. Uh, they con uh, continuously used to ransack parts of uh, Thailand, Ayodhya. Uh, they have also, you know, uh, had uh, attacked Manipur and positioned and positioned themselves and held some degree of, you know, suzerainty over parts of Assam. Uh, so they have a very strong sense of their nationhood and their unity. And this has been sort of reinforced by their uh, uh, historical myths of all their emperors. Uh, so, you know, they are not easy to, uh, to push. Um, e even countries like China would find it very difficult to, you know, completely push the, the sort of sense of um, nationhood that uh, the Myanmar army represents. Um, but um, it is very difficult to see, um, you know, uh, it's very difficult to see right now any kind of approach that will work. The ASEAN is the, is the best uh, way forward. Uh, I would think that if ASEAN were to enlarge its approach to include the neighbors, uh, of uh, 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 Myanmar that have been excluded from the ASEAN format. Uh, China already is doing, you know, uh, engaging and, uh, you know, uh, diplomatically engaged in the process. Uh, India is not. Bangladesh is not. So I would, and I would say that countries like Japan also have uh, equities on both sides, both with the military as well as with the civilian government. Uh, so I think countries in Asia that have the influence uh, uh, should I mean, I think the ASEAN should, without uh, diluting its centrality, should be able to expand its approach uh, to include, uh, uh, to include uh, you know, countries like India and Japan uh, to be able to work together to find some kind of solution. Uh, the, as you know, the United Nations, um, the, the Myanmar army has been resisting them. Uh, yeah. The, the old special envoy has left, a new special envoy has come in. They haven't renewed the office of the special envoy. Uh, they see the United Nations very much, um, you know, pretty much as a kind of instrument of the Western powers. Uh, they have the support of the Chinese and Russi Russians to make sure that it would not be like that. Uh, but overall, I think they are more suspicious of international organizations and uh, the United Nations. And they would be more inclined to work with uh, Asian powers. So last question, do we have any influence over them at all? I don't. Uh, yeah. Well, you, you know, as I said, uh, very few countries have real influence over them. Mm -hmm. um, India does not really have, you know, the kind of levels of investment or equities uh, to be able to inf influence them. You know, what are the major sources of influence? It could be the economy. Uh, yeah. Our trade levels are very low. Our investment levels are very low. Um, uh, we, we are not a permanent member of the Security Council who can shield them as, say, Russia and China can. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, the levers of power, of levers of influence um, are not there with us uh, for the time being. And I think we have to, and the only approach that we have is really to work with other countries um, and, uh, you know, to... and. Um, the other approach, of course, is that, uh, you know, if the inter international community, so far, I would say the international community has pretty much neglected and not really supported the civil disobedience movement, the democratic yeah. uh, movement, the youth of the country who are looking for alternatives. And another approach could be, you know, a gradual political approach. We just have to wait and see how the situation unfolds, whether the Tamado is able to establish some kind of authority and governance. Uh, if this resistance continues, uh, you know, I see that the ethnic armed organizations will tend more and more towards a, a kind of de facto autonomy. Um, it's quite possible that uh, under compulsions, neighbors will have to deal with those uh, institutions. Uh, we're already seeing a kind of government in the making in, in Rakhine state uh, by yeah. the Arakan, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, nationalist uh, forces. Um, so I think it's a very, very fluid situation. Um, but in the sh short and medium term, uh, 
I don't see, uh, uh, you know, a stable uh, kind of um, situation uh, in Myanmar. I'm, I'm sorry to be uh, pessimistic for the sake of uh, the Myanmar people. Uh, but uh, overall, one senses that the democratic forces are on weaker ground and they are not getting the kind of support that they hoped for uh, internationally either. So going forward, it's going to be tough. Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, thank you very much for that perspective and that insight. Thank you. Um, Welcome. Looking forward to continuing this conversation as we go forward. Sure. Thank, thank you. you Good day. Thank you. And for all of you who are uh, tuning into this uh, conversation in the new year, uh, keep following us. Uh, we, we look forward to your comments and observations and, of course, your questions. Uh, follow us on our Instagram account. Follow us on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Thank you and goodbye.